You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. If you followed the Heart of Giving podcast, you know that I really emphasize the power of the arts to change people and institutions and indeed society. Recently, we had an episode where we focused on several dance groups and what they have been doing to inspire young people to be lifted out of desperate situations into possibilities that can enrich their lives. And they've done it through dance. Well, today, we're going to follow up on that in a big way by bringing to you the Misty Copeland Foundation. The Misty Copeland Foundation. Now, there is a name that I'm sure anyone, both inside of the arts and outside of the arts, have heard about. Because Misty Copeland, who will be one of our guests today, is the first African-American principal dancer. The first African-American principal dancer. Can you imagine that? She's here with us today on the Heart of Giving podcast, and she's going to talk about her career, of course, but more importantly, what she's now doing post-career to continue her legacy of uplifting young people in particular and inspiring them to not only be great dancers, but great citizens and successful people in in ways that they define it. And we also have with Misty the executive director of the Misty Copeland Foundation, a real pro, Karen Campbell, who has had significant roles in other arts organizations, both dance and film, including the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and also Paramount Pictures and others, and including Spike Lee's organization as well, where she worked on the great film um, about Malcolm X's life. So we have these wonderful, this wonderful duo here with me today, and we're going to get into some really significant com- conversation about what they're doing to lift youth so that they can achieve the most with their lives. Ladies, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, Misty, the first question is for you. You've had an amazing career in dance. How did it get started? And how did it really inspire you to want to later do more for young people who may be following in a similar path as you? I grew up in um, in a household that was very much... Uh, full and rich with love and music and chaos, but also a lot of um, instability. Uh, My mom danced. She actually was a professional cheerleader for the Kansas City Chiefs football team. So we, you know, had that athleticism and, um, and dance, you know, I think in our, in our DNA, um, all of my siblings, um, I'm one of six. Um, but never had the means, you know, the access or opportunity to be exposed to, um, you know, formal, formal classes in any way. Um, so 
the arts and, and music and dance uh, became a release for me just internally. I would hear music and I'd want to move my body and I wanted to create and I wanted to choreograph, even though I had no exposure to it outside of the house and seeing my mom moving around. Um, and, you know, it gave me this sense of, um, you know, feeling that I had a voice. Um, it was a creative outlet for me which I think is so important, especially in communities and in environments where there isn't a lot of consistency and stability, but to feel like I had something that I could count on and that I could rely on that was giving me a sense of purpose. Um, and so it wasn't until I was seven years old that my family picked up. We were constantly moving, but we settled in a small town in Los Angeles called San Pedro. And that was the first time I was introduced to um, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, a community center in my neighborhood. It was right across the street from my public school and it was a it became a second home. It was a place that um, my mom could really rely on this community to take care of her children while she was working multiple jobs. Um, and it was the first time I was really exposed to, I feel like, what it meant to be a part of a community, um, to be in an environment where there were other adults that cared and uh, wanted to nurture us. There was mentoring and tutoring. Um, and a couple of years later, um, I was exposed to ballet at my club. So I took my first ballet class at the age of 13. Um, there was a, a local ballet teacher that was looking for more diverse students to bring into her uh, ballet studio on scholarship um, because she understood the importance of having having diversity and that it wasn't something that was immediately accessible to a lot of black and brown kids. Um, and she saw my potential. She called me a prodigy immediately. And I ended up living with her for three years, training in her school on full scholarship. Um, and within four years, I was dancing professionally for American Ballet Theater. Um, but because of that experience, I understood what it, what it meant to have a team around you, a team that was going to support me um, and and give me the the tools and the skills to go on to be whatever it was I wanted to be. It wasn't just about, you know, creating uh you know, the Boys and Girls Clubs weren't thinking about creating a pipeline to American Ballet Theater, but it was exposing these young people to an opportunity that would be able to allow them to see themselves in a space that um, you don't often in, often see yourself. And so having that background and having that base um, it has allowed me to understand and see the value and importance of arts, of arts education, um, because it's given me an incredible life. It's allowed me to blossom into the woman that I am today and go on to do so many things, not just as a performer on the stage, um, but given me the confidence uh, to know that I can transition into, uh, you know, so many different um, spaces uh, because I have the same passion and mission in mind when it comes to all of these things that I'm doing. It's amazing. I, I think about my own life to some extent, and obviously you know, we all need a start and we all need mm -hmm. adult support. And for me, it was the local YMCA, same kind of thing. There were just adults there who cared, who supported, who were trying to get us focused on a particular thing to keep our interests, right? Mm -hmm. But they were really thinking about what might we do after all? How might we max out on what our God-given gifts were, however, you know, they manifested themselves. So it's so wonderful to hear this story because I see that in so many young people. And it's because of these institutions, these nonprofit institutions that we're able to have these kinds of experiences as we grow up uh, as young people. You had this amazing experience growing up. And you obviously saw dance as your path, your passion, you had the talent for it, and you had an amazing career. But obviously, it was not easy for you to be an African-American woman in a relatively, in a field relatively dominated by Caucasian women. Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges that you had to overcome? 
in order to achieve the status that you did in this profession? I mean, it's it's difficult to, you know, exist day in and day out in a space where you don't see yourself. You don't see yourself represented. I was the only black woman at American Ballet Theater for the first decade of my career. And, you know, as a young person that's that's still coming into their own and finding their voice and 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 identity, um, you know, it's it's difficult when you when you can't really connect um on a, on a lot of different levels with the, with the people that you're surrounded by. I mean, and, and not just because of my race, I think also, you know, um, econ- economical, you know, socioeconomical background and, you know, class, all of these things that, um, you know, there's a certain uh, specific uh, targeted audience that ballet has been created for. And to this day, we're still struggling to, um, you know, expose it to a broader audience and, um, and, you know, give opportunity, uh, to young people that don't have the, the, the means to, uh, get the training, but trying to find some balance so that there is more, um, you know, equal opportunity and diversity within, within these spaces. But, you know, so just as a young person day in and day out, not having someone that I could, just, you know, have conversations with about, you know, the obstacles I was facing. And then there's the, you know, overt uh, situations where you're not being given opportunities in, in the more classical repertoire, which is very common for a lot of black and brown dancers throughout history in this field, um, where you're seen or you're told that modern dance, hip hop, tap, everything that's not classical ballet is something that might be more organic for you to do. Um, and so, you know, when it came to more of the the modern and contemporary ballets that ABT was doing, those were the roles I was getting, but I was never getting those opportunities in the pure classical roles. Um, and so those were things that I was, you know, fighting up against and tr- having to really, uh, f- you know, stand up for myself and have agency over myself and and uh, over the things that I knew I deserved. And I wouldn't have been able to do all of that if I didn't have an incredible support system specifically of black women that were in my corner that were rooting for me, whether or not they had been in that in the ballet field that were saying, you know, we have been the first in what we are doing. And though you are alone in that room, you are not alone. We are here with you to support you. And so that's always been something that's so important for me to be that for the next generation. Um, Because, you know, what are we all doing and going through these things and having these experiences for if we're not learning from it and passing it on to the next generation so that it is easier for them so that they can make leaps and go further than we could ever imagine ourselves going. Um, and so that's really just, you know, all of these things that have that have been difficult for me um, in in my field have been fuel for me to move the art form forward and to give more opportunity to the next generation. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I could I could go on and on about all, all the things that have been difficult, but I think that it's important just to really, you know, um, to focus on what I've learned from those experiences and how we can make uh, these spaces, um, you know, better, better for the next generation. So we're fast forwarding a little bit through your career now to a point when you made a decision that it was important for you to create opportunities for those coming after you. At what point in your life did you come to this realization or this this notion that you had to do more to help others? You know, I think that I learned this from being a part of the Boys and Girls Club. I think that it's something that was uh, really just um, being exposed to that way of creating community and supporting one another just became like a a natural thing for me. Um, And so throughout my career, I've been trying to find ways to create opportunities for others. Um, You know, from the moment that I met my manager, Gilda Squire, and we've been working together for like 13 years, um, you know, she said to me, what what is it that you want to say? Um, You know, what is it that's important to you? And it's always been important that I, I give back to my community 
I try and create opportunities for others to have the experiences that I've had. And how do we do that? You know, we started out um, years ago where I would just go to different public schools and speak to the kids, show them that I'm a real person. I'm not just someone that you see on TV or a poster on your wall or far away on these in these big theaters, but that I'm just like you. I come from situations like you. And, um, you know, it was with nurturing and love and support that got me to this to this place and just show them what's possible. And over the years, you know, of course, it's been difficult because I have a very full career that takes up a lot of my time. Um, but within the pandemic, it really allowed me, you know, some space to step back and say, what can I really do to create something that is really meaningful that will hopefully last beyond me um, for young people, especially young people that are in under resourced communities um, to be able to be exposed to the arts and, and ballet uh, specifically. And that's when the foundation was formed uh, was during that time when I when I had when I had some more time on my hands to really form what it was I wanted to do. And, you know, thinking back to my own start um, was really the inspiration for starting our first signature program, Be Bold. Um, and it's really just blossomed from there. Wow. So you, you got this organization going. Who was the first person you turned to when you made this decision to, uh, to get this foundation up and running? Well, the king of all kings of philanthropy, Darren Walker. Darren Walker. <laughs> Darren Walker, you know, he's <laughs> been someone that has just been um, in my corner uh, for so many years and um, and has often said to me, you know, when, whenever you are ready to take the next steps in, in, um, in whatever it is you want to do, you know, post your career, like, I'm an ear. I'm here for you. And so he was the first person I called and, um, and he, you know, uh, was not, you know, I was very thankful that he was someone that was like, I can give you resources. And it wasn't about, you know, taking my hand and doing anything for me, but, um, you know, this is up to you. This is, this is whatever ideas you have. And I can just, I can connect you to people. Um, and that's when I was connected to Jane Poland. Um, my philanthropic advisor, who has been a godsend, um, and she's really helped to build the the small but mighty team that we have. She found Karen Campbell, um, you know, and it was really important for us to have a strong team of women and um, women of color, at least when we're building the foundation. Um, and so it was really just incredible that Karen was even interested and that we got her to leave an incredible organization where she had already done so much work and had made such an impact. Well, for those of you who don't know, Darren Walker is the CEO of the Ford Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the world. He is an African-American male. And uh, a wonderful leader and supporter of things that help move our society forward, particularly around race and various types of disparity. So we want to hold him up, and I'll get Darren on the show one of these days mm -hmm. to get a chance to talk also. So that's a great one. Yeah. And you mentioned Jane Poland. I've known Jane Poland for probably. I want to say 35 years. Don't tell Jane I mentioned how long. <laughs> but uh, a, tr a tremendous leader and supporter and a person who will get things done. Mm -hmm. So it's been wonderful to have her as a friend also. Well, you, you mentioned Karen. Karen, you know, you found out about this. And obviously you have had a, an illustrious career of your own. So you hear about the creation of the Misty, Misty um, Copeland Foundation, and you decide to just drop everything and, and go to work for this fledgling thing? I mean, what, what was going on in your mind? My feeling, Art, is that I dropped everything so that I could go work with Misty because what she wants to do with the foundation, and in particular to start with the signature program, Be Bold, is to work with young children in a way that has not been done before. 
And as much as I love working for Alvin Ailey American Dance Foundation, and I miss working with everyone um, because it's an amazing institution, I feel like I have the opportunity to work with her to do something, to build something from the ground up. And I hadn't had that opportunity before. Well, that's always a challenge because, you know, in, in the nonprofit world, there are 70, 80,000 new organizations created every year. They're all looking for funding and they all believe they have a tremendous mission and they have to get to work on solving the problem that they were established to solve. But it's tough. It's difficult. But I will say, reading your resume and looking at your background, you give this organization great chance because of your fundraising background. You've raised a lot of money in your life. You've obviously um, worked with organizations in this space. So uh, you have a head start that I would say a lot of organizations don't necessarily have. So I wish you a lot of luck with that. Now, coming over, what did you essentially want to accomplish? Did you Start out by saying, you know, let's get a strategic plan going. What was your, what was your steps that you began to implement as the first executive director of this organization? Well, I, I first want to say that one of the best things that the organization has is Misty herself, because as you know, most or many founders aren't necessarily hardworking. And, and doing, you know, saying what they're doing. And she is certainly that. So that is a huge advantage for me and also for the foundation. Um, well, and I, I bet think, you, I bet you if I asked her the same question, she would say you were the best thing that they had going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I think we make a pretty formidable team. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, but I would also say that to begin, um, I think Misty bringing, having Jane as the strategic advisor for the foundation was very um, instrumental in setting us up for what we wanted to do from the outset. Um, so when I started, we already had one semester under our belt of the program and with a lot of support from advisory council members. Um, that Misty had put together um, in the field of dance education and the world of dance, um, which was very helpful. So as the program has progressed, I think the most important thing, it wasn't to create a strategic plan. It was to make sure that the framework for the program was correct and that we had that down because before we could do anything, we couldn't scale up. We couldn't implement, you know, more classes or employ more teaching artists or musicians. We needed to make sure that that was the correct structure. And the framework, I, I feel like in the last, we just celebrated a one-year anniversary in September of the program that Misty and our program director, Cindy Folgar, have done an amazing job at fine-tuning what the program should look like and who it should be geared towards. Because when we started, it was for eight to 12 year olds. And we determined, Misty and Cindy determined that it should really be for five to 12 year olds. So that created a completely different framework. And there's so many things that we will do and we will be able to do from there, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but that that really was the beginning. Yeah, I want to get into the mission a little bit. So let's talk about the mission itself. What is it that you're set up to do? And what are some of the programs that you're implementing to achieve that mission? We, we wanted to create um, an environment and in a community uh, within, within the ballet and dance world. So how do we bring greater equity, diversity, and inclusion to dance and to ballet specifically? And with the first program, Be Bold, you know, it's, it's, it's about creating an atmosphere in, in, a, in the classroom that's accessible, dance that's accessible, that's affordable, and that's fun. Ultimately fun, because I feel like there's so 
so many tropes and things connected to ballet that you know it's it's you think of this old russian woman with a stick in her hand <laughs> and no one can speak and it's very uptight and oh we want to show the fun in dance and that can that can happen in ballet as well so the be bold program that's our first and signature program um it stands for ballet explorations ballet offers leadership development so you know again as i was saying you know this isn't about creating a pipeline into professional companies this is about exposing different communities to this art form um it's about creating the framework which which karen's been talking about you know we really took the time and worked with amazing partners to create a framework that uh you know really speaks to the communities that we're going into right now we are at karen correct me if i'm wrong is it 15 sites we're at 14 sites 15 wow. classes so we are in the Bronx and we are in Harlem. Um, and so, you know, when I when I think about these communities and I've had these conversations throughout you know, the course of my 25 year career, um, especially in black and brown communities where they just feel like ballet is not for them. The music, the classical music's not for them. Like they don't see themselves in these spaces. And so I've always thought, well, how do we create a a technique, you know, use the ballet technique, but create an atmosphere where they feel like ballet is for them. And so you can't just take this white European art form and bring it into the Bronx and into Harlem and, and say like, hey, do you see yourself uh, when, when they don't? So, um, you know, it's, it's from the ground up, um, it's how do we speak to, you know, representation. So from the moment they enter the room, it's a positive environment. We're checking in with them. There's a circle up. We sit on the floor and we see them. We hear their voices because often dancers are told your body is your voice. Your movement is your voice, but you're not really allowed to express yourself verbally. And we want them to feel like they have agency and that they have voice and that they, we see them and we hear them. So we check, we check in with them, see how they're feeling before we get moving and moving our bodies. Um, they're learning about ballet history from the beginning so we're we've we've named the ballet bars after different black and brown ballet dancers in history because those those are the histories that we don't see documented you know they can learn about so many ballet dancers throughout history if they google they open up a, a ballet history book but they're not learning about the the ones that look like them so it's important that we really have that at the forefront um, of, of this training um, then they go into you know the a typical ballet class at the at the ballet bar except for there's fun different ways that we mix it up in between combinations so they may have improvisation that happens in between a, a plie or a, a tendu. And we really give the teaching artists, artists um, the power to take what we're doing, but put their own spin on things. We have an incredible teaching artist who has even implemented rap into um, part of nice. what she's doing when she's teaching the class. So they're learning, a, they're learning, you know, these raps about the ballet technique and rhyming and connecting it to the movement that they're doing. So it's finding fun and creative ways to um, introduce young people to this very old traditional art form. Um, and then of course the musicians, I think that they're definitely like the stars of, of, of um, in the classroom because they're really bringing it to life. And, um, it's not just classical piano, which is what you're used to in a, in a ballet class and environment, but we have musicians of every kind. We don't turn anyone away when we, when we uh, are looking for musicians um, in our classrooms. So they're being exposed to live music, which is not often the case for young people, especially in these communities. Um, so we're really trying to create an atmosphere that's supportive of, of them. And, um, you know, even hearing music that's reflective of their cultures. Um, yeah, so it's exciting. Uh, like Karen said, we're just a, a year in with the program and we've already, you know, we're listening to the communities, we're listening to our teaching artists and we're growing and, and tweaking as we as we go. That's why we're not calling it a curriculum. We're calling it a framework so that it has room to breathe. Wonderful. So you mentioned like 15 locations. So you do you partner with other organizations? I assume these aren't just locations that you've stood up on your own, right? I mean, how does no, that work? I, I mean, Misty really wanted it to start with the Boys and Girls Club since that's where she began. 
Mm-hmm. But as we've continued to grow, um, we've reached out to other community-based organizations in the Bronx and Harlem, um, from union settlement houses, YMCA, as you mentioned, um, Harlem Children's Zone, KIPP Infinity. So we've we've kind of spread out as as we've continued to to grow. You know, dance is such an amazing uh, art form. I mean, kids almost come out the womb moving their bodies. I look at through the um, during the pandemic, my family, my my daughter and my son combined, they've had five children since in the last five years. <laughs> so I have five grandchildren. The last wow! Five. Wow! And you know, I, I go visit them, and I look at these kids. And, you know, no one's told them anything about dance. They just hear some music and they start you know, <laughs> moving around and stretching their bodies out. And it just seems that it's such a natural thing for us to do to respond to sound with our bodies in the way that people do. Um, I guess my question is, do you feel that because of what you're doing, there will be opportunities for young people to see how this form of expression can actually communicate in ways that maybe they wouldn't be able to communicate verbally. They may be able to express what's going on in their lives in ways that they might not have had someone not articulated to them that dance has that power. 100%. I mean, you just broke it down and and said it so beautifully. Um, Like, have you been listening to me? Are you in my head? (laughs) I mean, just that, that idea, like you said, you know, like it's, it's such a natural and organic thing. Like you said, you know, babies come out of the womb and they're moving their bodies. They respond to sound and to music. It's such a natural thing for human beings to do and to experience. But yes, you know, movement is is an incredible and powerful form of expression and and often when words can't suffice dance and movement and that type of creative expression really i think is is what you know fills in and um and there's sometimes there's no there's no way to replace that and so again from my own experience i was such a shy and quiet child i literally didn't speak my nickname was mouse <laughs> my family was shocked when they when the, i i told them i wanted to dance because you know i had to go on stage and perform and they're like do you understand you have to be in front of people and you have to be on a stage um but there was something that was it, it worked for me it allowed me to express myself in a way that I was comfortable and that I could not through words. And so that's definitely at the top of mind, you know, with giving young people this opportunity, it's, it's showing them that yes, there, there are, there are other ways of expressing yourself. And a lot of them aren't getting these opportunities in their schools. A lot of the time, you know, recess is being taken away. And, you know, we're thinking about, um, you know, test scores and, and the, you know, the physical expression or just getting up and moving your body is left behind, Um, you know, and so having an after school, um, you know, opportunity like this, I think just makes sense. And especially in these communities where they most likely aren't getting it in school. When English is a second language for some of these kids and finding a way to express themselves or feel like they belong. Um, which they can in, in these circumstances, it makes a difference. I was going to ask about the the age. You, you decided to take it younger. What was behind that decision? Part of it was that post-COVID, we had a lot of younger children who were showing up for after-school activities after being isolated in their homes and wanting to have the experience of being in person and doing something like this in person made such a huge impact. So we had started out at eight to 12, but we had many five and six year olds. Um, so that really was part of the impetus. So talk about Be Bold. Tell me what is behind that. What is the, uh, the core of Be Bold and, and what are you trying to achieve with it? Well, Be Bold is um, an opportunity to 
use ballet to meet these young people where they are. I think it's also an opportunity to create um, to create community uh, within the, the dance and ballet world specifically for our teaching artists and musicians. Um, it's it's a small, tight knit community, but there's not often a lot of uh, communication and and support in terms of what so many dancers have experienced um, as young people with those teachers, like I was talking about, that um, often are not nurturing or are not thinking about people who maybe don't look like them or that come from different uh, backgrounds and different communities. So, um, you know, we have an incredible team and I can let Karen speak to that, you know, of, of people that we've, we've brought on board that are really there to support Support our teaching artists and musicians as well as our young people. But it's creating, uh, Be Bold is creating a more positive, um, you know, fun environment uh, to experience dance and experience ballet. Karen, anything you want to add to that? Well, in terms of what Misty was alluding to, we have from the beginning worked with a child developmental psychologist. Um, to do impact survey research so we could determine from the beginning the impact that we're having on the children, but also how to better help the teaching artists and musicians to work with the children and for themselves, as well as a DEIA consultant, which was very important in how we entered spaces in these communities, how we speak to the children and how best to serve them, but also it, it has helped the teaching artists and musicians as well. It's helped them heal. Yeah. There's so there's so much trauma, I feel like, with the way a lot of a lot of I mean us, me included, have been taught throughout our throughout our uh, you know training and um, and upbringing that is not always healthy. And how do we let go of that and not continue the cycle, um, you know, in the way that we're teaching, you know, the, the children today. And so it's been, it's been great to have that type of community where we can come together um, quarterly. Um, well, for the teaching artists and musicians, even more than that, and have these conversations and really undo a lot of that damage. I wonder if your program also has some influence and effect on parents and caregivers or children? That's a great Maybe. question. What would you say about that? Um, we have made a very concerted effort to make sure that the caregivers um, buy in and understand what we're trying to do with the kids. Um, so we do have caregiver orientations with our teaching artists and musicians um, and the caregivers, so they understand what the program is, what the mission is, what we hope to accomplish, you know, what we're trying to do for the, for the kids. But also, we've extended that so that we've started trying to reach out to other community organizations so that we can have tickets to performances and that we can offer those to the families because it's really important for them to see that we are trying to affect the whole child and the whole community. It's not, you know, we want, we want to really be a part of that community. So, for example, in the spring, we were able to get um, tickets for Ballet Hispanico for family members and children and even the teaching artists who often can't afford to go to performances um, they were able to go see Ballet Hispanico at City Center. And for them to see themselves, people who look like them on stage, uh, it was so meaningful for everyone. And we're so we're trying to do that more. So cool you mentioned Ballet Hispanico. I had a chance to interview Eduardo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a wonderful man he is. He is so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, well, you know, I, I could... I feel like we're just getting started here and and obviously we can't go on forever but <laughs> let me just try to conclude the interview today by asking both of you what do you see that we may get from your work here in a decade or so if you had to ask yourself looking back 10 years from now what did we achieve what might you say what do you hope you're able mm -hmm. to say you know, I, I hope that we 
we are affecting not just these communities, but that we're, we're making an impact on the ballet world and the ballet culture that they're seeing the things that need to change and that there are ways of, of making um, real, you know, productive changes when they are more inclusive and really take a moment to step back and look at, look at ourselves and see the work we're doing and see how we're, uh, you know, it can be harmful if we continue on in ways just because that's the way it's been done for this long, but that we really take the time and um, care um, to look at these these people that we're exposing dance to um, and think of this, you know, as it, it could be the most positive experience they have in their days, in their lives, um, and that that's a big responsibility. And so I hope that we see impact and change within the, the ballet community. Karen, anything? Yeah, I would say I really hope that we're able to do a couple of things. One, um, as we go through through the next couple of years, that we're able to deepen the the goals that we hope to attain, which would be to include mentoring and tutoring. Um, we really want to try and grow and build that aspect because we know some of the many of the community based organizations already have that built in, but we'd like to take that to the next step and and do something within our organization with that. And I also would hope that we would be able to go national, that we would keep building so that we're growing out, you know, so we would have Be Bold and other programs across the country and that we would be able to affect change um, in, in the way that we've started to do. Well, I'm certain that some people listening to this show today will want to find a way to reach out and support you. Um, how might they do that? They can do that through our website, which is www.themistycopelandfoundation.org and also on Instagram or on Instagram as well and Facebook. Fantastic. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, and all who don't count themselves as binary who are listening to this podcast today. You have just heard from Karen Campbell, who is the executive director of the Misty Copeland Foundation and the one and only Misty Copeland, the first African-American principal in a, in a major ballet company. And they are putting in some serious work to make a difference in the lives of young people in this country, particularly through the art of dance. And I just want to say to you, thank you both for gracing our show today. Thank you for what you're doing and for what you're doing for these young people in particular. And just thank you for the inspiration that you've given to others who are listening to you and thinking, maybe we can do something too to make change in our community. So we appreciate you and we wish you continued success with what you're doing at the Misty Copeland Foundation. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Well, for all of you who are listening for the first time, the Heart of Giving podcast is a weekly show, and you can find us on all major podcast platforms. I hope you will subscribe to the show. If you would like to support us financially, you can do that also by going to our website, give.org. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. 
This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.